Okay, so now let's get into our last topic. It's about shadow prices. So in a short time, I'm going to tell you what are shadow prices and what's the implication about them. So, uh, let's start with this motivating example. Suppose we go back to our product mix problem, and here we produce tables and chairs with two resources, wood and <coughs> labors. In total, we have six units of wood and six labor hours. Each table is sold at three dollars and requires this amount of resources. Each chair can be sold at another price with this amount of resources. The question is as usual. We want to formulate a linear program to maximize our sales revenue. Okay, so this is a typical product mix problem. We certainly may formulate this problem as this. We define two variables as the number of tables and number of chairs produced. And then we have this very simple LLP formulation. With the graphical approach, we can show that the optimal solution is at three zero. This point, okay. So that means we should produce only tables with no chairs because producing table is so profitable, and that's why we have the optimal solution with three chair, uh, three tables with no chairs. Okay. So so far everything is fine. What's interesting in practice is that we typically ask "what if" questions. So, uh, what if the unit price of chair is not so high? Uh, is not so low. What if the unit price of chairs becomes two dollars? Okay, will that change our optimal solution? Or, what if each table requires three units of wood instead of two units? Okay, three units. Or, what if we have ten units of wood? Wood. Okay, these questions may certainly be asked when we are doing our business. Okay, because we have no idea whether things will become different, or in many situations that we want to know how may we make things better. So. These questions may be asked when the following things happens. First, we know parameters may fluctuate. Today's price may be different from tomorrow's price. Tomorrow's cost may be different from today's cost. So that's why we need to ask what will happen if something changes. Also, our estimation may just be inaccurate. When we make decision, we need data. And for data, sometimes we need estimation because some data are not so accurate. For example, uh, in the product mix problem, it seems to us that everything looks fine, but maybe that uh, in some production process, the amount of wood that you need may changes, right? Because in some situations, the process is not perfect, and some part of woods are、uh, wasted. So. The parameters may need to be estimated, and you may want to ask, what if、uh, we allow some errors, some tiny errors in our estimation? What if the parameter are not as accurate as we think? Okay, and finally, in some situations, we ask what if questions is because we are looking for some ways to improve our business. Okay, and this will be one of the central heart of this、um, topic: shadow prices. So, for realistic problems, what if questions can be very hard? Because even if we just adjust one tiny number in our formulation, the optimal solution may change a lot, may switch to a completely different position. Okay. And certainly, we typically do not have some ways to predict it before that happens. If we do not、uh, have some enough knowledge, okay, we certainly need to analyze the linear program so that we may ask, what will happen if some numbers changes, okay? And the tool for us to answer what if questions is exactly the field or the subject. Called sensitivity analysis. Okay, this is a very interesting topic, and it may 
be worthwhile for using, for example, two complete lectures to discuss sensitivity analysis. It's a pity that we don't have enough time in this course. So, I will complete my discussion about sensitivity analysis in these two videos, and certainly restricted myself in a very limited topics. Okay, but you're going to see uh, the main concept. Here, I want to first give you one another example adapted from the textbook. Pacific Lumber Company, which is now the Humboldt uh, Redwood Company. This company owns a large or a large amount of forests and five mills in the United States, in California. And their operations is to get forest, get lumber, and then sell them, okay? Uh, process them and then sell them. Sustainability is certainly an issue when they make operational decisions because uh, every time when we want to uh, get woods or process and get lumbers, we are awareing that these trees are assets of all the human beings, right? When we are while we are making money, we also need to make sure that we are protecting our environment enough, okay? And we want to make sure that we are not getting all the trees at the same time, because we want our forest to be sustainable. We want that when we are doing business, we can do that. Uh, for a very 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 long time. If we cut down all the trees today and make a lot of money today, then we have no business to do tomorrow. Okay, so sensitivity is some uh, uh, sorry sustainability is something that is typical for this kind of industry. So now, because they need to address this issue, they contracted with an OR team to develop a a, a model for forest ecosystem management plan. What's very interesting here is that this plan, the planning horizon is 120 years, okay? So if we are talking about forest, that's definitely uh, reasonable. But somehow, it's much longer than most of the typical planning horizons of typical products, right? So this certainly creates a great difficulty or a great complexity. Eventually, the team formulates a linear program that can optimize the uh, timberland operations for maximizing profitability and satisfying constraints, including sustainability constraints. Okay? They certainly need to add these sustainability issues into their model so that they may uh, get balance between money and sustainability. The model is somewhat huge at that time. There are a lot of functional constraints and even more variables. Okay, so if you go back to read the textbook or read the article, it's about 20 years ago. When they do so, it's certainly challenging. Even today, there are still some difficulty, uh, some technical issues you need to handle if you want to solve this kind of programs. But certainly today, people are able to solve uh, those much bigger programs uh, in a very short time. Anyway, there are complexities. And what's even interesting is that environments keep changing, right? For example, climate today and 10 years from now or 20 years from now may definitely be different. And all we may do is estimation or forecast. We forecast what's going to happen within this 120 years horizon, but things may definitely be out of our imagination. Climate is an issue. The market supply and demand is another issue. You have no idea about what's going to happen for other forests in the world. Okay, you need to do estimation, and again, things may change. The cost of operations and environmental regulations may all need estimations and may all change. Okay, so sensitivity analysis is applied for them to get a whole picture about the model and about their operations. You are encouraged to read the application vignette in section 6.7 and the full article on SEBA. 
and、uh, that will help you to get an idea about how sensitivity analysis is important in practice. Okay, so let's go back to、um, our discussion. In general, what if questions can always be answered in the following way? So I know some parameters、uh, are changed. Okay, I want to ask what if one number becomes another number. So I just formulate a new optimization problem from scratch and then solve it. Certainly, that's possible, but this may be too time-consuming, right? Suppose you have a very very large problem, and each time you solve it, it takes a lot of time, and then just one tiny number change, and you need to do the whole process again. Then that's not very satisfactory. You certainly may have some information from the previous optimal solution, and probably your answer may be,、uh, your question may be answered with that information. So sensitivity analysis is the subject of finding techniques so that the original optimal tableau can provide some useful information. Okay, here for tableau certainly we are saying that we used the simplex method. From the previous tableau, we hope that we may read some numbers to help us save some time or to get some idea about the new optimal solution. What we typically do. Is to start from the original optimal basic feasible solution. We then modify the problem, and we know what's going to happen in the optimal tableau, and then do just a few iterations to reach the new optimal basic feasible solution. So, I'm not going to give you the details here, but I just want to、uh, want to emphasize that we. Solved the original problem and get the original optimal solution. Okay, we're there, but now the problem is slightly changed. Okay, the problem is slightly changed. So instead of solving the new problem from scratch, typically we will start from the original optimal solution. Use our knowledge from sensitivity analysis. Then we may just need to do a. Few iterations instead of ten thousand or ten million iterations from scratch. Okay, we will start from the optimal, and then do a few iterations to adjust ourselves to the new optimal solution. That's typically what we want in sensitivity analysis, and in many situations, duality provides a theoretical background. Here, we just want to introduce one type of what if questions. What if I have additional units? Of a certain resources, okay. So consider the following scenario. Suppose one day, a salesperson comes into your office and offer you the following thing. He says, "I'm going to give you one additional unit of wood at a price one dollar." Then your question is, should you accept or reject this offer? Certainly, the an- the question should be answered by evaluating the the value. Or the benefit of this one additional unit of wood, right? So let's see what we may do. I want to answer this question. So I may formulate a new linear program like this. This number becomes seven because if I have that additional unit of wood, this would be my new capacity or new supply amount of wood. The new problem can be solved graphically. We can see that the original constraint is here, and now with one additional unit, it moves to the right, and the feasible region expand a little bit. Then the optimal solution becomes three point five. The new objective value becomes one point five larger. Certainly, it is good to accept this offer because this one additional unit of wood cost me one dollar. Okay, but it will allow me to earn one point five dollars. So zero point five is my net benefit, which is really good. Okay, with that I can earn more money. But if the thing changes and the salesman is is offering me one additional unit of labor hour at one dollar, the problem would become something different. And now, what's changing is this constraint. It will move upward, and the feasible region will also increase a little bit. Okay, 
But in this case, the optimal solution is not changed. The optimal solution is still here. It's draw 3. So that means the new objective value is the same as the old objective value. And it is not worthwhile to buy this one additional unit of labor hour. In this case, the net loss is $1. We spend $1 to get this and earn nothing more. So we have a net loss. Okay? So, no matter who comes in and offers you one additional unit of whatever at a whatever price, you know you may formulate new programs to, to answer whether to buy it. But now we want to find a more systematic way or a more efficient way for an answering or anal analyzing these problems. And eventually that will be our topic, shadow price. Okay, let's do that in the next video. Thank you.